the way that it like spoofed the the chat gpt api and like fed the responses through i was like god i didn't know it could work that way i was like this is this is brilliant Hello everyone, my name is Oliver. I'm joined today by Patrick Kettner and we're both developer relations engineers on the Google Chrome team. We're joined today by Matt Frisby. Matt is a Google developer expert and author of the book, Building Browser Extensions. Matt, I'm really excited to have you with us today. Yeah, well, first, thanks for having me on. Um, it's exciting to be here to talk about extensions, a, a piece of technology that is near and dear to my heart. Um, yeah, so I published uh, the book, Building Browser Extensions at the end of last year. Um, it was, it remains the only major title uh, about browser extensions, um, and I'll, we'll get into the reasons um, why that is. Um, and then my, uh, my full-time job is uh, I run a startup whose product is a open source and free browser extension. Um, and we'll get into the details of that as, that as well, but um, it has proved to be uh, both lucrative and very effective in the space that I work in. So um, yeah, I, I do a lot of extension work in a lot of different ways. So is there actually a connection between the book and the startup or like which one came first? Or... Uh, there, there is a very intimate connection between those two things. So um, if we rewind, rewind uh, about five years ago, uh, I left Google, I used to work here, um, and I left to start a, a startup in the cannabis industry mm -hmm. focused on compliance tech. Most states have centered upon this one platform, which is called Metric. And so the startup that um, I started working on, uh, we basically wanted to build a, uh, a marketplace that directly interacted with this compliance platform Metric. And so this was, you know, this was five years ago and the, the company ultimately didn't work out. But um, where extensions kind of come into the fold is that uh, I was the only technical member on the founding team. And so, um, it was put onto me to develop this huge piece of tech to integrate with this compliance platform, um, which has has a public API. It's not very good. It's hard to use. The documentation is not good, and it doesn't actually do everything that you need. And so, um, it is still the case today, five years later, that um, most of the legal industry in the United States is still using. Um, the website as the primary way to use this compliance platform, even though they have an API, because the API cannot do everything. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, if you want to use the API, it's not open. You have to pass tests that each um, in each state that you want to use it in. So right now, it's I think it's available in like 23 states. Mm -hmm. So as a single developer, for the, I would have to go if we wanted to be mm -hmm. roll out nationally, I would have to pass an ex a, this like test that they run mm -hmm. in 23 different states. Mm -hmm. And then there's also other things like some, some states you have to have like special insurance and things like sure. that. It was just prohibitive for like a, yeah. a small startup. Mm -hmm. So um, we spent like a year and a half like building this like monstrosity of a tech platform that was like <laughs> trying to interact with this API and it was just not happening. Mm -hmm. And so um, at one point we said, okay, everyone's using the website. Forget the API. Let's go directly to the website. So I started to um, look at their website directly. Um, which is all these companies are logging in and re mm -hmm. recording their compliance on it. And I said, okay, w a, a much more effective way of a single developer integrating with this platform is to me just build an extension mm -hmm. that talks directly to their web servers, which are using a completely different mm -hmm. API, but a complete one, and I don't have to pass all these tests. And so that was the genesis of this product. So the the first piece of this extension that I ended up building was um, there were wildfires in California I, that burned down a bunch of farms sure. I, probably four years ago mm -hmm. now. Um, and uh, there are some communities that I was following to just kind of get a finger on the pulse mm -hmm. of what people were doing. And so um, there was this very, um, to, like, uh, as part of the compliance platform, there's like these, mm -hmm. um, you have to like tag everything in it right. so you can like track it in the platform. Um, and so when the farms burned down, they had to like void all these tags. And so these, these farmers that, um, that had to, um, you know, go and like void these tags in this in in the the compliance platform. They would have to go and like click 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 click, and then like wait for that to submit. That's one tag, and they have like to do ten thousand of those. Yes. And so their farm burned down, and they're like spending their like they're spending like right. multiple evenings like just their livelihood. Okay, is gone okay, and okay, now right. And so I I look at this and I go, this is insane. Let's automate this, yeah. right? Like I obvious solution. So that was the V1. So the V1 of this product was, I built it overnight because really? extensions are very easy to build. And like all it was, it was just like this simple plugin that 
just automated all, all, all the clicking to do this. And so instead of spending six hours clicking on this platform, you could do it in 10 seconds. And I would say this is such a common story that we hear of like old enterprise software uh, that like, is really hard to modify, uh, but there's something that you want to do which should be really easy to build. Mm -hmm. And like extensions are such a nice way to do that, I think. Yes. And um, starting from that like simple point, I think as I, because I didn't know anything about extensions, like that was totally self-taught. It was like, all right, well, let's let's see where this goes. And then as the rich API of extensions started to unfold, I was like, oh, well, this is an interesting place that we could, you know, let, let's explore this area. Like, let's, you know, like use their like cookie, like their authenticated cookies and like we can talk to the server directly. Like, oh, let's, you know, manipulate the page in these interesting ways. We can like automate these like very lengthy tasks. Yeah. Um, and so like it's, it just started to make its own gravy and it just, um, mm -hmm. it kept going. And so now, um, you know, fast forward, um, uh, you know, uh, so the the company ultimately shut down, but I, I, I basically, I have, since I, I started over and I, I basically rebuilt the product into the current iteration, which is called Track and Trace Tools, um, which is an open source and free um, extension for the cannabis community that integrates directly with this um, compliance platform that everyone has to use. And so um, it is, it's used by a thousand companies. Um, you know, I, there are hundreds of, hundreds of, hundreds of them use it every day, you know, from mom and pop shops to like the, the absolute, the absolute multi-state monstrosities, um, lots of them use it and it's, it solves a lot of problems for them. It's, it's a very strange space to work in. Like not a lot of people have mm. found success in this way, but it is a, a totally unique solution that really you cannot replicate any other way. Like there's, I, uh, short of like building this, like gross headless browser sure. solution, which I, I don't even know if that's, <laughs> if that would even fix things. Like yeah. there's just, there's not a way to address this problem. Mm. Um, with the, the limitations. So um, the business that I run now is grown organically in this kind of unusual way, and it's all fueled by the ubiquity and power of extensions. That's fascinating. So like, I think all it's a really common ex user experience to go to a website, especially like government mandated websites, and they're built by the lowest bidder. They're usually overwhelmed with all kinds of, they have a lot of technical requests, and they're not the best UX. And you were able to kind of give them, the end user, what they really want in a system that was actually safe and legal for them to use. That's amazing that, that you've been able to do that. Um, so how did that lead to a book? Yeah, so um, so this was so after the the first company shut down, um, I was kind of and before I had I launched the mm. the second version of the extension, I was kind of I was kind of sitting there, kind of figuring what I wanted to do next, and um, part of it was like you know I have gathered all this knowledge of how to build an extension and like the knowledge that you develop starting with like no knowledge like that that series of like just cutting your teeth on like not knowing what you're doing and having to slide through documentation and figure it out is is cannot be cannot be replicated any other way like it's just it's the the slag of building something is um paramount to like truly understanding something sure. but you also gain insight into the the mind of a novice like it's very hard like as a you know when you're a seasoned developer mm -hmm. you forget what it's like to not understand a subject and i remember um kind of coming out with all this knowledge like okay i know how to build extensions now but also I also have a very intimate knowledge of what the landscape looks like. So at that time, it was extensions were right in between like Manifest V2 and V3. Mm. So there was this huge fragmentation of like all the examples on the web. And so I remember I was like, you know, you'd find an example like, oh, let's, you know, how to use this API or like how to build a simple extension. But the codes, the, the code snippets are not like tagged MV2 or MV3. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, God, like, is this applicable? Does this even work? Like how, you know, are these things even possible? Like, oh, this person built this using, you know, because some things between MV2 and MV3 are mm -hmm. totally incompatible. So I was like, God, this is a nightmare. And then like, the, you know, some of the APIs, you know, were not as well documented mm -hmm. as others. Um, and it was all very confusing. And so I was like, okay, let's put together this single repository that's geared toward, or not repository, let's put together a text. Because mm -hmm. um, I had written a number of books before. So mm -hmm. the rhythm of it, I had, Kind of gotten into and i kind of i know what resonates well with developers who are kind of looking to um you know dip their toes in the water or jump in entirely <laughs> um and so i was like okay let's you know there's so much that could go in this book and like there's so many angles because it's like the the way that browser extensions work like it's it's in this like weird hybrid 
um, I think I think I started off the book. I was saying there were like weird and wonderful parasites, which people <laughs> took issue with. But it, I I really I really stick by that because um, it's true. Like they're not they're it's it's not a standalone product. It's the the whole utility of them is that they sit on top of the open web. But like therein lies the magic of like building extensions. Um, and they're you know as you start to unpack all the available APIs, like they're massively powerful. Um, I almost to a fault, and I'm sure we'll, we'll touch on that later. Um, but it was like, I was like, okay, like I started to like put together the outline for this book and I was like, oh, like let's do, um, you know, let's cover like all the basic components. Oh, and let's do a section on deployment. Oh, let's, you know, you know, Safari is like, you know, running a extension program now, like they're, so you build extensions in Xcode and like, oh, so, you know, it just started, it's just on and on and on, like how do permissions work? What are the best ways to deploy? Like this knowledge that like is kind of spread out in some ways and doesn't exist at all. And so I was like, all right, let's just smush it all into one place and like put it in a book and like, because th there's nothing. Like I searched, I searched Amazon. And I was like, you know, there's eight thousand books on how to write Python. But like, I was like, build an extension. Not, I mean, there's yeah, not no, there's nothing. There's, I was like, how is it? How is this possible? Like there are, um, and you look at like, cause it, and it's um, you know, extensions are. I like I ran the numbers on like the 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 comparative sizes of like marketplaces. So obviously the app store is gonna be bigger, but mm -hmm. it's not that much bigger. And so and then the other thing is you look at like. Um, I think there, you know, there are a couple big examples like the the Honey Chrome extension, which um, I think was acquired by PayPal for like billions of dollars, like a a, a very hefty payday. Um, and like there are huge, you know, huge like um, a company called Loom. I I I know one of the founders personally, and like their first product was a Chrome extension, like for recording video. And so there, are, um, like the you know, it's it, it really does follow a power law of like some of these, the biggest extensions are like have huge user bases and like really are super useful. And so, uh, you know, it, you can keep going. Like you can look at like, you know, I, um, you know, uh, ad blockers and um, uh, password managers are two of the most important pieces of like user privacy software that you can use in like any context. And so, um, extensions have, I, I, the book sort of wrote itself because like you, you put down the outline and it's just like, oh, like I can, I can just write forever about this. Um, and so like, you know, when you're, when it's rolling downhill like that, like you just roll with it. And so, um, yeah, that's, that was the genesis of the book. That's fascinating. So you mentioned that extensions are a really big space and it's sort of challenging to break down into the initial steps for a new developer coming to the platform. How did you go about that in the book? What do you think of the, the specific steps that you would recommend to someone getting started? Yeah, so um, the book was intentionally designed to sort of um, go step by step from a more digestible piece of extensions into some of the more obscure pieces. So um, the more digestible pieces are pieces that um, are replicative of like what a website is. So like the pop-up, for example, like that's a very easy to understand. It's like its own web page. It has some special rules, but like it has an interface that, you know, is is basically like a website and there are the, there are pieces the of extension pop-up. The extension pop-up. Click that yeah, icon so in the corner. You click the button and the, the pop-up comes up. Um, that's a lot of, you know, a lot of sites use that, um, or not a lot of sites, a lot of extensions use that. It's a very easy, you know, it's easy for the user to understand. It's easy to, to work with. Um, so that's a very approachable piece of extensions. Then, you, you know, you can go into options pages and, you know, you go into developer tools and things like that. Um, things that have user interfaces. And then building on top of that are the more abstract stuff. So it's like once once you get into things that don't have a user interface that are tying together these disparate pieces, um, that's, uh, you know, you kind of like work into that because I think one of the pieces that I sort of struggled to understand when I got started with extensions is that there's not, it's not like a mobile app where there's there's an interface, like there's a there's always an interface and you, it all starts from there, right? You can, there are buttons to press and it's like, it's, you know, visually it's very easy to understand. Sometimes you install, install an extension and there's no interface. It's just like, mm -hmm. it automatically works or like it's, you know, the, the place where you're setting, you know, changing settings and things like that are like hidden or hard to get to or, you know, it's sometimes it's like totally transparent. Like you install an ad blocker and you'll, you may never open it. Right? You used the analogy earlier of like building on top of the browser. And I think that's really nice. Like you may be running code in specific tabs or you may be running some code in the background mm -hmm. that you can, you can really decide what makes sense for your extension. It, it's super adaptable. Um, and I think that's once you, once you're able to sort, once you have the entire um, kind of network of all the different pieces that are available at your disposal. I think that that's when you really like the light bulb moment mm. goes on, and you're like, "Oh, like this is super powerful, and I can do all these like really interesting things with it." So, 
Um, yeah, and I, you know, I, I spent a lot of time in the book kind of laying out the, the landscape of like how all these pieces talk to each other. Like no, none of these are technically required other than this like very, you know, basically the manifest and you can you know, go hog wild. Like it all, um, yeah, go, go, you can sort of take it wherever you want. Um, so it really, it's like once you, once you kind of have the, the mental model of like what extensions can do and where they, you know, where they touch and like how it's going to be driven and like all, all the different ways. I think that's, that's when, um, the, the learning developer can really start to like grasp, um, how all the pieces fit together and like all the different ways that they can be applied. So in your research into the book and your startup and everything else, was there something on the extension platform that was surprising to you? Like you were relatively novice, but by the time you wrote a book, presumably you felt fairly comfortable with it. Did you end up learning stuff? Do you feel like it was really digestible? You knew the whole platform already? Oh, no. I So, yeah, I mean, I, I you know, I'm, I'm just about to publish my fifth book. And I, I can say definitively that like, and any author who tells you otherwise is lying, that like <laughs> you're learning as you're writing. I mean, you you know enough to like put together the outline, but it is first and foremost a self-guided research project because you're really, um, it's it's one thing to like know something, to, but to be able to put it, lay it out in a way that is accessible to a reader, especially a reader who doesn't know anything necessarily, um, that, that process, is is still a learning process. You're still going to uncover stuff that you don't understand. You're like, oh, I like I didn't know it worked that way. I mean, the high level, like you know how it works, but like the the minutia of like all these different places, like it is absolutely a learning experience. Um, and so, I mean, even now, like I still, um, I still, I'm like, I, I'll still see stuff. I'm like, God, I didn't know like extensions <laughs> could work that way. I, I'll I'll give you an example. Um, so you know, Chat GPT launched at the beginning of this year. It was a phenomenon, um, and right away. Someone built an extension, ChatGPT, for Google. That was like, it was a, you know, I'm a big Hacker News person. And so it was like number one Hacker News and everyone went crazy about it. And I'm like, I'm like immediately, I'm like, oh, extension ChatGPT. Like, let's, this is, oh, this is mm -hmm. you know, uh, this is great. And that was after publishing the book. I was like, oh, this is, what a brilliant application of like it, this relatively simple, you know, LOM. Anyway, um, so I, I still am learning stuff, and it's such a it's such a wide space that um, I think it's really it's a ripe area for creativity because it's like it's I mean it it sounds like a cliche to say it's like it's it's unlimited what you can do, but mm -hmm. it, it really it's really it really is limited by your imagination just because the the APIs are so vast and so broad and so powerful. You know, it's funny that you mentioned AI. I feel like that's something that our team is really excited about, how we can maybe introduce AI to more and more websites over time, something that folks can add to their own websites or websites they have to use at their work or whatever. And, you know, is that, do you feel like that is a growth area, that it has a lot of future, or is that something that is more flash in the pan? Ab absolutely. Um, and so I, I think that extensions and AI, specifically large language models, um, are uniquely paired for each other. So on one side, we've got, um, we've got like the open web, which is a, a text-based platform, right? A, you know, HTML and JavaScript are all, you know, are all open um, and readable from the browser. Then we've got extensions, which are capable of reading all these and understanding them. And then we've got the language models, such as ChatGPT and Bard, who are able to ingest large bodies of text and understand them in you know, very intelligent ways. Sure. And so... Um, Right, right when um, ChatGPT came out, I wrote a blog post that talked about uh, how there's going to be this explosion. Mm -hmm. I, I call it the Cambrian explosion of um, AI extensions, saying you know that this pairing is is it's right there. Like people are going to figure this out really quickly. And when I wrote it, I was like, there's probably a hundred extensions, and mm -hmm. I said, I, you know, there's going to be like a thousand in three months. There's probably way more than that now because every everyone figured out really quickly that you go, all right, I can just suck all the text out of this page, throw it to the extension and have it summarize it for me, you know, figure out, you know, give me answers about it, you know, analyze it. Um, it's all instant. It's, it's amazing. And so, and it can be done trivially, trivially, right? Using, you know, using these widely used APIs that everyone is building on top of. The, the, the pairing is frankly beautiful and it's perfect. Um, and we only started to scratch the surface because, you know, we're, you know, the area of AI is still in its infancy. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, I, we are, we are certainly not far from having AI be like a core piece of like how we interact with the web itself. Um, just be, just by virtue of like how, how powerful and how perfectly it is um, uh, paired to just interact with the, the web in general. And I think that um, we're going to see a huge transformation in the coming years of like how we browse the web in general. And it, I, it seems likely and in fact probable that um, AI powered extensions are going to be a big piece of that. 
I, I think one of the really interesting things that we saw was that a lot of these extensions that we're building with AI were built by developers who had never built an extension before. Mm. So I'm interested, given like your experience and writing the book, does that surprise you? How easy do you think it is to build your first extension? Um, it's a great question. And you know, I see, um, I spent a lot of time on Reddit, and I see people <laughs> asking all the time, like, what is an idea for an extension that I can build? And I, you know, I, it's a, it's a tough, I, I understand the mindset. It's like, you see this exciting platform, but the platform is not enough. It's like, it's just like, okay, like that's just the, you know, the, the open field that I can run with, but like, I need an idea. I need a direction to go. And so, you know, this year when like all these AI platforms started to come in, I think people went, oh, that's the direction. That's how I can, you know, because I, it's, it's very simple to understand like, oh, let's feed in, let's feed in text and like get back interesting things. And so, um, that I think developers saw, they saw the, the extension platform, they saw the application of, you know, using these, um, you know, AI, these pieces of AI tech mm -hmm. that they can feed it into and they go, that's, that's where I'll start. So it's a very, it's, it's, it's relatively simple to build. Um, you know, if you have any web development experience, like, you know, you're, you know, you're working with a, a relatively simple API and like, you, you know, you're pulling text out of the page. These are easy things to do. So it's a super addressable way to like get in and make something that's um, frankly amazing really easily. So it is, it is no surprise to me that um, early developers are jumping into AI extensions because um, it's new and exciting and powerful. And that's, a, that's an intoxicating combination. So we mentioned that there can be challenges building extensions. I think maybe one elephant in the room to jump back a little bit was you were talking about building on top of existing websites. And when you build on top of an existing website, that website is prone to change. So is that something you've had difficulties with? Like, how do you approach that? It's difficult, actually. <laughs> right, right before we started recording this, I actually had to push a, pa push a patch to my product just because it, it, something had changed. Um, yeah, it's, it's a problem, and it's sort of, um, it's something that you have to wrestle with. It's just the nature of developing extensions that like you're building on top of an undocumented platform. And so you sort of have to weigh, um, you know, what are the consequences of that? Um, so I think there's a couple ways to think about it. One is that I, there's, I, I would say that there's a, a built-in sort of forgiveness from people who are using extensions. Like you're, if it's sufficiently good and it's, it's advanced their productivity or it's helpful enough, like, um, and you're responsible, you know, responsive enough as a developer. I think that there's some forgiveness, provided you you're pushing patches regularly. Um, but yeah, you sort of have to figure out creative ways to figure out, um, you know, when these platforms are advancing. And some are easier to build on top of than others. Um, I think you have to be you have to be judicious about exactly the ways you're integrating. So um, you know, some websites that are you know have um, are you know if. If, 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 if a platform you're building on top of is like, I don't know, an Angular or React platform that's like, you know, compiled and minified to hell, it's like, it's really, it's really hard to, to, to build on top of that when like you're, you know, if you're, if you're poking through the, the, the HTML and you're like, you know, these classes are unrecognizable, it's really hard to be like, oh, we'll integrate in this way. Um, and and on, on the other hand, like if there's, um, you know, if you, if you aren't as tightly integrated with the page and you're sort of building this like, supplemental piece of software, which is the, the way that I do it, um, it's you sort of arrive at this kind of stable equilibrium where, mm -hmm. yeah, you're a little bit exposed to like changes they might have, but um, you, you know, it's it's just sort of the cost of doing business. Um, and, you know, you, you integrate with the pieces that are the most powerful. So like, you know, talking with the web servers, which are just naturally probably going to change less because they're not going to be swapping around their APIs all the time. Um, and, you know, you, you build supplemental interfaces that aren't like totally dependent um, on how the page works. And so I think actually that's so, it brings up an interesting point is that that is one of the most, um, int having worked on extensions in the way that I do for so long, I think that has been a really interesting piece that I've had to learn is um, building resilience. So the, the product that I work on has multiple tiers of failovers. So like everything you write, the way that you integrate with the page, the way that you're integrating with APIs, like you have to sort of expect it to change and you would like to have like a graceful fallback. So if one piece breaks, the whole thing doesn't collapse. You architect it in a way that you go, okay, this fails, like let the user know it's not working, but like everything else will be untouched and like this small piece will just like fail on its own. So you really, it's, it's an excellent exercise in building resilient software um, and ultimately the product you build, you know, even if a small piece breaks, like people are still extremely happy with it. 
yeah, so it's I, it's still totally possible, even though if it's a little bit more fragile than you might be um, in other contexts, like it's still totally possible to build a great piece of software, um, you know, provided that you've taken the proper precautions and you're being a responsible developer and maintaining it. And I, I think something that I would add is that this certainly isn't the case for all extensions. And I think you sort of know what you're signing up for. If you choose to build an extension which is really dependent on the page, then you run into some of these problems. At the same time, you could build an extension that's like letting a user take notes beside a page, and that will be less prone to break and is maybe a good place to start. So that, that's a great point. So they're not, yeah, not all pieces of extensions are susceptible to this. So if you're building, um, if you're building like sort of a standalone extension that's sitting on top of a supported API, you're not really exposed to this at all. Like if you're, if it's living in the pop-up and, you know, so it's completely sandboxed from the page and, you know, you're talking to the supported API and, um, you know, maybe you're only minimally talking to the page itself, like you're just not going to be exposed to these same problems. Whereas if you're tightly integrating with like direct pieces of, like if you're, for like an example is like a lot of people build them like Gmail extensions. Mm -hmm. So it'll like go to the Gmail page. Have you seen the Gmail HTML? It's a nightmare to build around. Oh my God. It's like, oh, it just takes takes so long to get anywhere. And, and you, know, who, you know, who knows what, you know, Google might change it tomorrow because it's their platform. Um, and so you're exposed to that. So, um, I mean, I think, I think we can point out specifically content scripts as like kind of the wild west part of extensions. Like, you could, sorry, can you explain content scripts? Oh yeah, sorry, I, that might not be um, familiar. Yeah, so um, content scripts, right? Mm -hmm. So you're able to, in a couple different ways, inject JavaScript and CSS directly into the page, modify the page, read things out of the page, um, interact with the page, change the page, you know, dispatch click events, things like that. So um, this is probably one of the most powerful pieces, but also kind of the most um, uh, unruly pieces, kind of hard to wrangle. Because, um, you know, when you inject stuff into the page, like you're kind of fighting with the page's JavaScript if you're not careful. And so, but you can add in widgets, you can change colors, you can change the appearance, which like the users love, like uh, how many extensions are there out there that like change how your Facebook looks or something mm -hmm. like that, like people love it. And so it's a really, it's a, it's, I mean, they're awesome. Uh, but you're you're really subject to um, kind of all the all the nastiness of like basically fighting with the host page, which must still work, or you're you know they're they're going to install your extension immediately. Sure. One thing I'm interested in is as a product that is built on top of existing web pages that may be breaking at any time. You mentioned today there was a break today. Yeah. Um, how do you actually monitor that, and what's the kind of uh, plan for rolling out something? Is that something you can push an update for immediately, or yeah. how does that go? It's difficult. Um, I mean, you have to be, so there's there's a couple different ways. One is, I mean, the, the most the most effective way is to have a good relationship with your users and, like, kind of get, make it easy for them to, like, quickly report bugs. So, like, this, the bug that I fixed today was reported by a user. They go, hey, this isn't working. Um, they've, I mean, some of them are I, really good at reporting bugs. Like, they know to, you know, send screenshots, and, like, I have a, a place that they can record bugs. So, if you make it easy for them, that's the simplest way but you, you know you can't always rely on your you know having such an intimate i you know i work with sure. larger businesses and mm -hmm. so they're motivated to have this product but if it's just you know if you're uh, you know appealing to consumers who you're probably may not pay you money or you know are you're going to be not talking with at all mm -hmm. um yeah you'll need to have more automated solutions so i i have also built um built in um ways of kind of monitoring the host page so and this is you're not going to find an off-the-shelf solution for this. You're going to kind of need to need ways to um, monitor the host page. So, you know, pages will often display a version number, so you can kind of monitor, you know, you can have a reporting service that, like, uses the content script to, like, read out the version number and go, oh, it updated, maybe I should check the page. Or even more, you mm -hmm. know, they're monitor sections of, like, hey, here's this, like, take a hash of this JavaScript blob, and, mm -hmm. like, every time it changes, you go, you know, I should, you know, this is, I, I know that the host page just is a critical section of their JavaScript, mm -hmm. like, maybe I should check it. Or, um, you know, have some sort of, like, sentinel on the page looking for, like, hey, like, this text changed, or, like, these pieces changed you know, kind of watching for changes and then you can react to it faster. Um, but there's not a, I, there's not a one size fits all solution for this. And um, I, it's not a bad thing. I think it's just, it's just the nature of extensions. Like you're, you're the parasite. And sometimes, <laughs> sometimes the host is going to try and throw you off. Yeah. But it's not, I, it, it, it is a solvable problem. Um, it just, it requires a little bit of creativity and uh, yeah, care. I think maybe the answer that comes to mind for some of those things is sort of automated testing of extensions. Is that something that you do or that you've looked at in the past? Uh, totally. So, I mean, yeah, you can't you can't ship an extension without tests. Um, it is, I guess, one one thing that's especially challenging in extensions is that, like, going outside of 
um, outside of like unit testing as things get I, I would say more than a little sticky, probably a lot sticky. Um, I, it's something that I, I've dipped my toe in just to kind of see what it's like and um, it's kind of, it's a, little, it's a little bit ugly. Yeah, so like figuring out ways to um, basically automate testing, you know, you'll have to, unit testing is a big part of it, um, kind of like mocking out like whatever your host page looks like. Um, that that's a big part of it. Um, yeah, testing testing is hard just because of kind of the nature of extensions. And so you're not gonna, like if you're if you're running like a you know a, a regular website, like you can like spin up the website and you know do um, you know end to end testing things like that. And that's significantly more difficult with an extension just because like now we're mocking out like a whole browser and like the host web page. You know maybe you're maybe you're running your test against like an old version of the host web page or like you know you have to mock out the authentication or like all sorts of nastiness. So um, yeah, you have to. I mean. I, Personally, my solution is like I really lean on like unit tests and like a lot of manual testing. That's just that's just part of it. Like it's kind of hard to, um, it's very difficult to break out of that and just being very religious about like writing your test suites and making them good, um, and you know just <laughs> a lot of manual testing. Like that's that's just that, that that's just going to be part of it. Um, yeah, that's uh, that's that's kind of how I tackle that problem. Yeah, that's actually <laughs> something I'd like to. Uh, I think our team could really work on in the next year, coming time is is uh, improving of automated testing of extensions. I think that's something that uh, I personally, before I joined the team, something I wanted with my <laughs> extensions. Um, and if there were uh, more. Uh, requests of our team like automated testing yeah. or if people wanted to give feedback uh, maybe you could share how they could give feedback to us as a team uh, do you want to do or you can complete yeah so we have the chromium extensions mailing list that's a, a great place to go you can leave feedback there and we sort of hang out there and try and answer questions um, also there's the web extensions community group that's a great place to leave feedback on things that more generally you'd like the extensions ecosystem to address uh, so I know we were at TPAC last week which is sort of a a big gathering of people working on these sorts of things. And we were talking a lot about testing. And I, I think it's a really exciting space. Absolutely. Uh, already, like Puppeteer and Playwright frameworks like that have some very basic support for extensions. Mm -hmm. But I think we can do so much more to, to make that better. Absolutely. You know, it's something I, I, I'm really excited. I feel like we're in a very active time, a lot of growth for the community. Definitely. And I am uh, really excited to see, you know, where we go. So we were at TPAC last week, and I think the topic that was top of mind for everyone that was there at all the different browsers was actually the Manifest V3 change that's been coming out for quite some time. You mentioned that your book was written during the MV2 to MV3 uh, swap time period sort right. of thing. I think we're coming up on the five-year anniversary <laughs> of the initial announcement of MV3 changes coming to Chrome. Uh, can you give folks at home maybe a, a bit of uh, background on what exactly is the Manifest V3 change uh, as a whole? So yeah, so it's a, it's a a number of different things bundled into one, but there's a couple that that stand out as I think um, would be the most the, the most distinct for developers who are used to MV2. So um, in MV2, uh, the background takes the form of a, a headless page, um, and uh, it, you know it's you could control um, persistence and have it run indefinitely, um, and you know you can basically puppet this headless page to you know do your bidding um, <laughs> and uh, very useful I mean, it, it, it worked pretty well uh, but I think that there were there were some implications for um, consuming system resources because you know you it is it essentially you know when you install an extension like you might have it installed for five years and so are you just going to have this like extra background page running for the next five years um, so things to think about and so in manifest v3 um, that has become uh, the background now takes the form of a service worker um, and they can do a lot of the same things, just in kind of a different way. Um, but just by the nature of there no longer being a DOM in the background, like you lose access to APIs and have to like reform them in different ways. And so um, that's um, probably one of the bigger headaches for developers that are kind of switching over to MV3. And then the other big one is that um, uh, in Chrome, uh, you can't use remotely hosted code anymore. So previously, like if you like you can't call an eval anywhere. Um, and you can't, you know, you can't load JavaScript from some remote website. It has to be like bundled in. It has to be bundled, extension. right? And so, um, yeah, and I think that um, that is for people who are coming from like a web development thing that that probably feels a little bit unnatural. Like if you want to load like the Google Analytics, Analytics JavaScript, like you can't just like slap in a script tag anymore. There's a, there's a and quite often you'll just get like a, a link to a CDM, which is what the framework provides. Right, and so yeah, so there's there's a little more finagling needed to to make things work. Um, and there's other there's other pieces mixed into that. So um, right, the declarative net request is not strictly part of MV3, but it kind of was like rolled out at the exact same time, and um, that's kind of the deprecation of the web request API. Um, that's a big changeover, um, just because, and I, I think a big part of that was just because of the 
the abuse that happens from the web request API, like a truly a, a very, very frightening um, API that can be abused in a lot of... Um, yeah, the web request for uh, folks that aren't familiar, it basically is what allows you to run arbitrary code at any request. So you could inspect headers, you could inspect cookies, anything about the request you could do something with. Uh, and so that's how a lot of like content filtering, ad block and stuff is built on top of that. Uh, and so the issue as a browser, I think that we were really trying to focus on with that change with changes to like declarative net requests when we were working with all the other browsers on that uh, was how can we allow folks to have the same capabilities without the abuse that comes with that? Because yeah. when you have a hook that lets you run arbitrary code at every network request, I mean, if you've loaded any popular website, that's several thousand requests sure. just to get the thing going, yeah. right? And you, you look at how, you know, being able to, you know, have all these like different hooks for like every single web request and like running arbitrary JavaScript at each point, like it just on its face, you go this, this cannot possibly scale. So it is, it is, it is, it is a very sensible um, thing to address just because of kind of the nature of it. And, and just to clarify, the web request API is still supported in some cases uh, if you don't need to specifically act on a request and decide to, to block it or to redirect it. What we're really trying to do is take some of the common use cases, uh, so for example, content filtering, mm -hmm. and move that into a new API where you can uh, do the same things, but uh, without some of those trade-offs that we just discussed. Yeah, the actual a the APIs were designed with and by some of the major content filters like Adblock. Yeah, Plus, for sure. And we continue to work with them to mm -hmm. try and sort of make sure the API is covering all of the use cases that we can see. Absolutely. So I think it might be interesting to take a step back now. We've spoken a lot about the state of the platform today, but are there things that you'd like to see us work on in the future? I, I mean, I think the biggest thing to that I would love to see addressed is is kind of the developer experience. I mean, there are there are a lot of promising platforms that are kind of going after this, but um, I, you know, developing extensions is, is just in, in kind of a weird space. And like, there's, you know, there are, you know, things like Parcel, which I'm, I'm a big fan of, um, you know, platforms like, you know, Plasmo and all these other ones are kind of addressing developer experience to make it great and multi-platform, or sorry, multi-browser. Um, I Yeah, but like, we talked about testing before. Um, I think that there uh, there is so much that can be done to like make the developer experience great. Um, just because it's like, you know, you're, um, a lot, a lot of the tools that I end up using in my day to day are kind of just, you know, built on top of this, uh, you know, it's, it's just, it's, it's a very raw platform, um, in terms of like what the developer experience is and, but the end result is like so powerful that I see, um, there's tremendous potential for, um, just making it easier for people to get into and to like quickly learn how to do it and like, you know, get in, you know, start to use like these exciting APIs, um, yeah, so I guess addressing developer experience would be like item item 1A, top of the list. And I think there's so much low-hanging fruit there. Uh, Absolutely. So I, I'd love for us to look at that as browsers. And also, I'm really hoping that the community continues to work on things. You mentioned a few companies there. Uh, I've, I've seen different projects coming up to sort of add features like hot module reloading to extension development. Yes. I, oh my god, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that's something that we would all like and would all like to be easier. So I'm. I'm really hoping we keep seeing things like that coming forward. For sure. Is so there something that you're particularly thinking? What's your number one like task? Oh, um, yeah. I guess I asked the question, so yeah. I should I should have something in mind. Um, I think UI is a really interesting space. Uh, so we recently launched the SciPanel API, and that's a, a way to like similar to the pop up that we discussed, show some extension content in a place outside of the web page. Yeah. And I think continuing to look at things like that is really interesting because. Like we discussed, injecting stuff into a web page has some caveats and can be tricky. And so I think giving extensions more places to surface is something I'd love to see. The the sidebar API is very exciting. I, I'm I'm thinking of creative ways to include it because it's it's I've yeah I was for a long time I was like man I really wish I had like a sidebar sidebar thing on the side that I could just like throw some stuff into and I was like ah there it is. <laughs> Well, this has been such a great chat, so thank you so much for joining us. But we do only have so much time, so I think we have to wrap it up. I'm curious, is there anything that you want to say to the audience before we finish? If you haven't built an extension, go do it. It's 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 the most fun I've had um, writing stuff for the web, and uh, it's uh, it's really a unique platform, um, and uh, I I love it. Um, you can find uh, you can find my book on Amazon, Building Browser Extensions. And uh, I, if you're interested in the platform that I work on, um, you can it's trackandtrace.tools or just Google track and trace tools. Um, and if you want to check out the source code, it's on GitHub. If somebody has questions about you, is there a platform or something that they can uh, contact you at? Yeah, you can find me on Twitter. My handle is uh, at Matt Frizz. Yeah, that's probably the best way to reach me. Awesome. So thanks again, Matt Frisby, for joining us. And thank you all for watching. Mm -hmm.